Hey, good morning, everybody. While everybody's getting on this morning, I'm just going to go through some of the things that I use to study with because we have new people that are studying along with us and then some people that <clears throat> maybe have felt overwhelmed and not quite sure what we're talking about. So, oh, and it says congratulations because this is our 10th broadcast. So, everybody clap. Yay, it's our 10th one. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, first of all, I have the Holman Study Bible. And you want to get a Bible that has a lot of good stuff at the bottom. See how the verses are at the top, but then all of this good stuff down here is going to talk about what is going on. It's going to help explain it in modern day verbiage. So um, that's the very first step. You have to get a study Bible. Um, this is the HCSB Holman Standard Study Bible, you can get an NIV, the Life Application Study Bible is really good. So that's a lot of good stuff, and um, from the beginning, I've told all of you that um, we use the Bible Knowledge Commentary a lot, and this is one that we just started hearing Beth Moore talk about, so um, that's why I got that for the first time. Um, I picked this up at the um, bookstore, Lifeway. It's the Holman New Testament commentary. This is good. Um, it talks in lay person's language. And good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, everybody. Um, I love it when y'all say good morning. So it makes my day. Thank y'all. Um, something new that I got in. This is fun. And it's not a lot of reading in each section. It's the Jewish New Testament commentary. And you can also get a Jewish New Testament or Jewish study Bible, which that's going to be my next purchase, but I have to kind of space it out. But um, it has some good stuff here, um, like whenever you're reading about the woman with the issue of blood, like just things in that day that we don't understand, and it will it'll explain it. It doesn't do a lot of the overall explaining, but something that they thought you wouldn't understand because it happened in Jewish culture. They'll explain. So those are some fun tools because a lot of you, oh, and I wanted to go over some websites that I haven't been mentioning because if I mentioned them from the beginning, you would have just dismissed it. Some of you would not known what I was talking about. I wanted you to get real books in your hands so that it forced you to open them and look into them. But um, there's three reputable um, sources online. One is BibleStudyTools.net. BlueLetterBible.org and Bible Hub. I don't know if it's dot something. If you just do Bible Hub, you're going to find it. But they have different versions of Scripture online so that you can put what version of the Bible you're looking at. And then you can look at dictionaries and commentaries online. So if you're feeling like, well, my commentary is not answering my question, you can do that. Okay, we're going to get started today. I asked and a few of you, good morning, asked and a few have responded about what we are going to talk about. So I listened to your request, but I could not leave out this very first section about the man cleansed. So we are going to get started right away. Um, we have to remember a few things, though. We have to remember that um, these, are, um, these next two chapters, we just finished the Sermon on the Mount. It was like God's constitution for his new kingdom, the way to live. But um, the next two chapters are going to... Um, Jesus is going to perform 10 different miracles, and those miracles are fulfillment to prophecy. So again, Matthew is showing that Jesus is the king. He is the Messiah. He is heir to the throne. And um, he needs to do these miracles because there's a list, Jewish um, scholars, and they've made a list of all the things that the Old Testament said that Jesus was going to do, and one of them said he was going to heal a leper. Um, it talked about him casting out a deaf, dumb, and blind demon. So they had a list of all these things he was doing, so he needs to go through and perform these miracles, but he also has great compassion for these people, so he wants to, but his number one objective is to heal the heart of sinful man, not necessarily our, our um, earthly bodies, because he knows that's going to fade away, but he wants to heal our sinful heart. And so he does do these healings, but that's not what he wants to be known for. And so we're going to dive in this morning, and we're going to look at this very first section where Jesus has a leper come before him. Now, in Old Testament, and I can't look at myself in these glasses, in the Old Testament, leprosy um, was symbolic and 
it, it really it wasn't looked as a sickness you didn't have a physician come and check you out because you had leprosy it was looked at as a result of sin and you can um, study Isaiah 1 um, verses 5 through 6 points to this it, it talks about a person with leprosy and Jesus is saying it's because this is my rebellious child and um, so leprosy was looked at as a result of a gross sin. Um, it made someone unclean. And I really wanted to get into what clean and unclean was because Jesus spent a lot of time in the Old Testament, Leviticus, going through all these things that you can only eat certain foods. You can't eat foods that are unclean. You can't be around and touch people that are unclean. You can't be around a dead corpse because it's unclean. Um, women who were on their menstrual cycle had to be outside of the group during that time because they were unclean and he said all he spent so much time setting up all of these things to explain what uncleanliness was and it was really the whole time to be a picture that Israel needed to be separated from every pagan nation they needed because those pagan nations were sinful and he wanted a people set apart and separated from that and so even in their own culture culture they had to separate themselves from anything unclean and um, I want to do a quote. It said, um, the central lesson conveyed by this system of cleanliness and uncleanliness is that there is a God who is holy and man who is contaminated and must be purified to approach a holy God. Basically, sin separates us from God and we have to go through a purification system. In the Old Testament, you can read it in Leviticus 14, 15, I think. We'll talk specifically about if you came in contact with a leper, but if you came in contact with any of these unclean things, you had to go through this purification process before you could worship God. That's why they call it, and you see it sometimes in your Bibles, ceremonially unclean. Oh, there's a leper in my presence got swiped by him. Now I can't go worship at the temple because I'm unclean. But the whole thing is to get in their minds that God is holy, man is contaminated, we are separated by that sin, and we have to be made pure before we can come before him. And Jesus is coming in and saying, I'm that purity. You don't have to do all this stuff that you used to have to do in the Old Testament. I'm the one that's going to make you pure and clean. So he performs these three miracles at the beginning, the very first one, all three of these miracles at the beginning are performed to social outcasts. The first is to the worst of the worst. Uh, Matthew just dives in and says, we're going to start with the leper. That um, he, he heals a leper. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Then he goes and he heals a Gentile. Remember, all these Jewish men are waking up in the morning and saying, God, thank you I'm not a Gentile. Thank you I'm from, because I'm not a dog. And thank you that I'm not a woman. So he goes in and he heals a Gentile second, and then he heals a woman third. So again, this is just in the face of Jewish culture that these nobodies, the, these outcasts matter, and they're worth healing. But what I wanted to touch on is that a leper, for one, if you touched one, you were ceremonial and clean. But secondly, you wouldn't want to have ever touched one. Their, their skin literally was rotting off their bone. Um, it said that one of the first things to go is your nose. You don't have very many extremities because you have no more nerve um, feeling in your fingers and your toes, your knees. So um, they've said there's a recording of somebody even going blind because they were washing their face with scalding water in the 21st century. And their eyesight went because the water was so hot, but they never knew it. You can't feel anything. So you're not taking care of your body like you should and um, so you start losing limbs and they said the smell, you could smell a leper from a hundred feet away. So um, you wouldn't have wanted to touch this. You want, and Jesus doesn't flinch. This is something that is incredibly unheard of. And in fact, in, the, in Leviticus, there is a ceremonial cleansing if a leper is ever healed. There hasn't been healing except for Miriam and one other person, but it wasn't because man came and laid hands and healed him. This is going to be the first miracle by man. And um, Jesus not only heals him, and we know he can heal him by his just his very spoken word because we see that next with the centurion. He just speaks it. And it is, but he decides to touch this leper. This leper has probably not been touched in 30 years or so. And God, not only am I going to heal you today, I'm going to touch you, that human touch. 
And so, and he does the same thing with a woman, with a fever, Peter's mother-in-law. He touches her to heal her. And so this is a big deal. And we're going to, um, we are going to look at the lesson with this. The Old Testament lesson that we need to pick up on is clearly sin separates us from a holy God. And he's saying it is a very important um, to live a holy and righteous life. Not that we could ever do that to be with God, but this is important. He spent the entire Old Testament setting up a, how to be separated from the other nations, how to live clean, because he wants us to um, find that important in our life and strive and ask for hunger, uh, I mean, and hunger and thirst for righteousness. He says, be holy because I am holy. And so God wants us to to live differently. But then the New Testament um, outtake can be that God goes into the social outcast and he touches them. This is a physical manifestation that we can do because we are um, sons and daughters of God living out the Great Commission. We need to go into a world and touch social outcasts and love on them, share the love of God with them. So, um, we are not going to go through the other two healings in detail, but that was some good stuff there. Um, but then, and we're, um, let's see. Oh, following Jesus, the cost of discipleship in verse 18. Um, you see a scribe come, and I'm sorry, there's a glare on my glasses. You see a scribe come and say, teacher, um, I will follow you wherever you go. He wants to get in the boat because Jesus is about to rest in a boat, go across the Sea of Galilee and do some more ministering. And I think a lot of people say that he wants to get away from the crowds because he's done three, three, four. Well, he's done three healings that is specific, and then he's healed those around him. So he's tired. But the scribe comes and wants to follow him, and he calls him teacher. Um, he's not calling him Lord like you've seen people before. Um, it's not like he's clearly recognizing him as the Messiah. And um, Jesus goes on to tell him that foxes have dens and birds have the sky um, of the sky have nest, but the Son of Man has no place for his head. <coughs> He's saying that um, God, Jesus is saying, I don't have time to have all the comforts of home. I'm on a mission and I'm busy, and we're just I'm going to lay here for the night and. Um, so he's really just kind of speaking out, saying that you're not going to have all the comforts of normal, regular society if you follow me. And that's a message for us today, that we're not going to have a normal life if we follow Jesus. Um, I want to read something from Dr. Constable's notes. He is a, well, he was a, a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, and he said, Anyone who wants to follow Jesus closely as a disciple must be willing to give up many of the normal comforts of life. Discipleship is difficult. And um, so then he goes on and another disciple says, hey, um, I want to follow you, but let me go bury my dad. And this looks harsh if we read it, but many of the um, commentaries agree that they don't even believe that this um, dad is dead yet. They believe that this is the firstborn son and he's saying, hey, you know, there's a lot that I'm going to inherit, so I want to hang around, make sure I get that. Also, whenever somebody dies, it's not like for us um, where it's maybe a week-long event. This can be up to a year event where you hire mourners to come to your house, and then um, for a week, you sit in your house, you don't leave, and people come and visit you, and then you're there's this whole process of how to bury the bones because the firstborn is going to put the bones in a certain place. And then up to a year later when all the flesh is gone, you take the bones out and you put them in a certain box and some tombs. And there's a whole process with that. And so that can take up to a year. And so many um, commentators think that this man's father hasn't even died. He's just saying, hey, I've got a lot to inherit. I'm going to be busy. And Jesus looks at him and basically says, let the spiritually dead do those things. We've got a mission to do. There's a living people out here that need to be touched. And so again, as a Christian, our life isn't going to look normal. Um, again, Dr. Constable says, there are many worthy activities in life that a true disciple of Jesus must forego because he or she has a higher calling and higher demands on their time and life. And so... Um, the lesson here is that um, 
our life shouldn't look normal as disciples. Um, and normal things that can be good can just distract us. I was thinking last night as I was reviewing these notes that even my house, um, it's nothing fancy. It's an old house, but it is large. And um, I can preoccupy myself and my time with cleaning it because it takes a long time to clean but then also since it's big there's all these walls to decorate and that's something fun and something good and I can go to Hobby Lobby and get things half off and um, you know I like changing things around but all of those things are very time consuming and there's a mission it's like that like okay that's good stuff but why spend all your time in your home making it look pretty whenever there's a lost and hurting world out there and so our lives need not I'm not saying buy a tent and go live in it but we we need to occupy our time with being kingdom minded and thinking about eternity and so um that's my challenge is like okay the floors are dirty but you know I can go and dig into the word and I can go have lunch with some people and I can look at um just trying to have an eye open in my community and seeing where I can help and be the light to the world um the very last section, and we're going to have to go over, I've got about one minute left, but we're going to go three minutes, is um, because this is all building on one another. He goes into the boat and goes to the Decapolis. Remember the 10 um, Roman or Greek cities that are very um, worldly, very, very worldly. Whenever um, we went to Israel, um, our rabbi brought us up on this hill and said, look out, this is the most fertile land in all of Israel. And we all were like, oh, nice. And then we took a few steps and he said, now look at this. And we came across a Roman city and everyone just gasped. And we took out our cameras and we are um, taking pictures. And we were so just mesmerized by the beauty and the large scaleness of the city. And um, he pointed out, like, I showed you the most fertile land in all of Israel. It was a gift from God and not one picture. And I show you part of the Decapolis, sinful pagan culture and all of you ood and ahd. And um, so this is where he's going to where there's big, beautiful cities and lots of pagan worship. And he goes over and we know that this is in um, a region of Gentile land because there's pigs and there's people living among the tombs and things that Jews would have considered unclean. But uh, Matthew says he comes across two um, demonic men that were demon possessed. The other gospels only mention one and they think that one was just probably tame and quiet. And then we know from the other gospels, the other one named himself Legion because he was many. So they think that probably the other gospel writers just focused on Legion. But God um, cast the demons out into some unclean, the unclean spirits into some unclean pigs. They ran and drowned themselves. And, um, but the message here is we had been seeing all through this gospel that Jesus was healing and performing miracles. And his response would be, don't go tell anyone, go to the priest, don't go tell anyone. But, and, and here we see a very different story and I'm going to read it from Mark because I feel like Matthew cuts it off. But I love it in Mark, and you miss something big if you just read it in Matthew. So Mark chapter 5 talks about the same incident. And in verse 18 of Mark chapter 5, he says, And he was getting into the boat, and the man who had been demon-possessed kept begging to be with him. But he would not let him in. Instead, he told him, Go back home to your own people and report to them how much the Lord has done for you. yourself how much mercy God has on us and today didn't know I was gonna break down like this um I just challenge you remember we started this journey with that object in your hand an object of God's ministry and today I'll leave you with your testimony go into this world and tell tell people how the goodness of God and what he's done for you and that that man ended up going and doing this and changing the whole region. Your story can be the most powerful tool that you ever use. And I feel like a big goofball. But um, I just challenge you today. Go and share with the goodness of God and what he's done for you. Your story, your transformation. And um, go and hurt a lost and changed world. Anyway, I'll leave you late this morning. Sorry about that. Love you. See you next Thursday.